Hey Save Jerseyans, this is your blogger in chief, Matt Rooney. It's Monday and we're closing in on primary day, a little over two weeks away. Um, we have a few extremely contested races up and down the state. We have a competitive Democratic primary up in CD12, which we've been talking about because it's lots of fun to talk about Democrats making fools of themselves. We also have a very competitive Republican primary in the 3rd Congressional District where two guys are running to see who gets to replace John Runyon in the House in January. So the man I have with me today needs no introduction because our readers are well acquainted with him. He is the former mayor of Bogota, New Jersey. He was the chieftain of AFP New Jersey for many years. I think a lot of people remember you for your taxpayer minutes. Yep, I think so. Yeah, that's very visible. Um, and now he's running for Congress. So he's running around the state trying to meet with as many voters as he possibly can in CD3, Burlington and Ocean County before primary day. But he was nice enough to stop in here and update us on how the campaign's going and maybe give us a little bit of perspective down the stretch. So, Steve, thanks so much. Matt, thanks for having me. Oh, it's, it's great to have a... It's my uh, pleasure. Okay. This is a... Uh, um, this is a continuation of a terrific win that I had in the 3rd District just six months ago. You know, a win where um, I beat Cory Booker, the so-called Democrat superstar, with a, a stunning 8% victory. And even though I was outspent 12 million to 3 million, and of course Booker brought major name ID to the game, and, uh, and I was fighting an uphill battle the whole time. But despite that, my conservative message won this district by over six points, and there's no other candidate in the country or in the world, or the universe for that matter, that can say in the last decade they've won this district by that kind of a margin. So that's why I'm very confident about a win in November. What do you say to folks that go, okay, Steve, you won the third district last mm -hmm. fall, special election, right. but it's apples and oranges. It's a special election in October, but this is a general election in a turnout model where presumably the Democrats are going to have a good ground program. Uh, presumably, but Cory Booker spent millions and millions of dollars on what was supposed to be a fantastic ground program, and he beat the daylights out of me every single day. He outspent me on TV and radio by 20 yeah. to 1. He had an amazing email. He had enormous name ID. So, um, if anything, we have the base, and we prove that our conservative message works. But there's another issue, and that is in this, this election, the issues are even more powerful when it comes to Obamacare, which I'm committed to repealing in its entirety, when it comes to the economy, when it comes to the president's position on the military. So I think we're in a better position uh, to win even stronger this November. Now, repealing Obamacare, obviously that's at the forefront of, I think, totally. if not all primary voters' minds, yes. most primary voters' minds on our side of the aisle. The House has already voted multiple times to repeal Obamacare, but with the president in charge, as much as we hate it, he's there until at least a few more years. We've got a few more years of him to go. What can Republicans do in the short term to try to undermine this socialist nationalization of a quarter to a third of our economy? <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the question is, what have we done so far? And we have not been solid enough on this issue. You know, when I was helping in congressional races four years ago around Pennsylvania and New Jersey, the number one applause line that a lot of these insurgent Republicans use when they came in and beat incumbent Democrats was, I will repeal Obamacare, and people would right. go nuts. They didn't do it. In fact, they went down there and they voted for continuing resolutions. We need to be so com committed to this and loud and vocal about it. We're too willing to capitulate. And I think Americans are tired of the Republican Party folding on this issue, as well as a lot of issues. There's a real push for true conservative leadership, for outspoken individuals who are not going to back off. I'm one of those. When it comes to revealing Obamacare, I'm not going to compromise. I will not vote for any continuing resolution. I don't care what they tag to it that funds Obamacare. We need to draw a line in the sand. This bill is destroying our economy. It's destroying the future of our health care system. It needs to be repealed and replaced, by the way, with nothing. It needs to be replaced with the private sector, with free enterprise, and with people making decisions. So you think it's a matter of not just making our argument better going into 2014 and 2016. You think we need to defund now. We need use to the power it. of the purse and try to yeah, I think force we should use the power the of the government purse. to Look, quit funding that, this program. I, 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 there's a certain level of demoralization. There, no, not a certain level. There's a real level of demoralization in the Republican ranks that we haven't done just that. Can't the county Republican. I'm demoralized every day. The, and, and that we haven't backed <laughs> off. I'm tired of being, oh, you know, Lonigan, he won't go to comp He won't compromise. You know, Matt, you don't compromise on your marriage vows. 
You don't compromise on your belief in God. You don't compromise on your support of our nation or our flag. You can compromise on things like whether money goes to a tunnel or a bridge, things like that. And we're going to spend money on uh, F-18 or F-22 fighter jets. Right. But when it comes to principle, you never compromise. And the Obamacare package is about principle. It's about whether or not you believe in people and the free enterprise system, which has done such a remarkable job in this country of delivering the best healthcare system the world has ever seen, or you still think government should have some level of involvement. My position is the government should have no level of involvement. We'd be much better off, and that's what Americans want to hear. They want to hear clear, articulate voice fighting back against this. Yeah. Hey, listen, there's no argument there. Um, Obamacare is a major issue, undoubtedly. Now, moving forward, before you even get a chance to argue for the repeal of Obamacare in the general election, you need to overcome your primary opponent, mm -hmm. Tom MacArthur. Mm -hmm. Now, he is also going on record saying that he supports the repeal of Obamacare. Mm -hmm. Where are you two different on that issue? Since, again, I think that's, if we had to rank them, probably at the top of most people's lists for things that they're concerned about and they want to come out of the next couple cycles. Months ago, when Mr. MacArthur announced he wanted to run, he was asked why he was running against me, and he said I was too right-wing. Um, that's because I will repeal Obamacare and replace it with nothing, replace it with people making decisions and free enterprise system. My opponent has said very clearly that he supports a national health insurance a program of last resort for those who can't afford insurance and that he said would be funded by taxes on uh, health insurance companies, which we pay as consumers. Mm -hmm. He also has said that the federal government has a role in our health insurance. I disagree. I disagree on that very fundamental principle. The federal government has no role in my health insurance. They never had a constitutional right to have a role in my health insurance. The state, the U.S. Supreme Court made a bad decision when they allowed Obamacare to make keep moving as John Roberts allowed. We were very disappointed in that. And no, there should not be a federal health insurance program of last resort. That's exactly the words of Hillary Clinton. That's what Ted Kennedy wanted. At that point, once you accept the premise that the federal government has a role in our health insurance, that there should be a health insurance program of last resort, you're buying Obama's present premise. Now it's just negotiating how to get to that point. Full-blown Obamacare, maybe a little different, like the liberal Republican way of doing it. My answer is no. I'm a conservative. I believe in people and I believe in the free market. Repeal it and replace it with nothing. So even some of the things that are popular, regardless of whether they're conservative or not, like making sure that people could stay on their insurance beyond a certain point, up to maybe the age of 25, 35, some of the things that have been proposed, some of the things that are already in place. Those are Complete still... Complete 100% no compromise. No, no, we can repeal the whole again, thing. Or, when I went back to the beginning, issues like uh, having people allowed to stay in their health insurance up to a certain age, that's sort of a level of compromise that doesn't compromise principle. You don't have a federal health insurance program of last resort, but if you want to allow people to stay on the health insurance till they're 25, fine. If we can repeal everything else and we can adopt that, I'd be perfectly happy with that. Mm -hmm. That's still not the federal takeover of our, of our health insurance. The ability to buy health insurance across state lines is huge. Right. Um, the establishment of, of exempting doctors from malpractice lawsuits if they give pro bono work is enormous. I mean, I, I believe in a civil society. I like to see our charity hospitals flourishing once again. I'm particularly uh, connected to that because my mother was the secretary to the president of St. Vincent's Hospital in Manhattan, a charity care hospital, for 30 years. Her boss was a nun who ran that hospital. Oh, really? I didn't wonderful, know that. Yeah, wonderful yeah. facility, did wonderful charity care for people down the, the, the end of Manhattan near Greenwich Village. Now, once the government got involved, my mom's been out of there for 15 years. Um, the hospital went down. After over 100 years of being run by nuns as a charity care hospital, once the government got its claws into our health insurance industry, there goes our charity care hospitals. I want to replace government programs with civil programs. With civil programs. Civil, with, from a civil society. Now, when you're running against candidate Beauregard, because it looks like Amy Beauregard is going to be the presumptive Democratic nominee, mm -hmm. she hasn't even been able to propose anything she wants to fix, <clears throat> let alone repeal. She doesn't support repeal because she's a strong proponent of socialized medicine. Yeah. But not just here in the 3rd District, but around the country, how can Republicans best go about communicating this message? in a way that doesn't say, we don't care about you, we just believe that free market conservative principles are going to make you have a more prosperous, healthy life 
for you and your family? You know, the great Austrian economist Friedrich Hayek wrote a terrific book called The Road to Serfdom, Nobel Peace Prize winner of 1948. I'm a fan. And uh, it, there was a piece in that book, it was a little short blurb, but I've always remembered. And he said that the, the liberal approach resonates rapidly with the populace because it's emotion-based and it's quick sound bites. The conservative message is harder to deliver, but once you deliver it, you win. Mm -hmm. You win the majority. And, and that's how we need to do it. We need to be able to articulate, like Ronald Reagan did, the great communicator, who was not afraid to say that big government programs were the slippery slope. He was not afraid to say, for example, uh, do we have the courage to end the immorality of the progressive tax? People cheered for that. You don't hear that today. Um, it will take time and effort and work. But I spent my career at Americans for Prosperity educating voters and I won some pretty tough battles against what were popular programs. I worked to get and successfully convince Governor Christie to pull out of cap and trade, despite the radical environmentalists. I ran a massive statewide effort to defeat a 8% sales tax and $450 million for embryonic stem cell research. Had overwhelming support until we communicated the truth to voters. Um, and that will work again. Yeah, I mean, look. I think that there's a lot to be said for shying away from, pie pa from pale pastels and going for bold colors. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that was Reagan my next quote, line. Right, yeah, yeah. right, yeah. I mean, that's what Reagan said. At the same time, and this is my opinion, and I've repeated it over the years, so this is nothing new. I think sometimes that one of the things that differentiates, differentiates what we do now from what Reagan did is that so often it comes across as negative. We don't uh, uh, communicate he, things in an optimistic way. Yeah. And I hear so much of... This rhino stuff, and it's not just related to CD3, but it's around the country where undoubtedly you have a situation like Toomey Specter several years ago. God rest his soul, but I was glad that Arlen Specter lost that election because <laughs> you had credible conservative alternative. Yeah. Somebody was communicating things optimistically. Hey, he was a guy that was very involved in pro-free market education, Pat Toomey, before he ran in that race, yeah. versus Arlen Specter who was an old school Rockefeller Republican. Needed to go. But so often today, I feel like we're, we're, we're almost splitting hairs. Not that these issues aren't significant, but gun control, for instance, in this race. Mm -hmm. You both seem to me like you're pretty solidly mm -hmm. two-A. There's little differences. Like, I know Tom MacArthur, at a meeting um, when he was in Randolph, raised a question about whether or not you could use compound bows within a certain footage of the perimeter in the backyard. I think you back during the 2013 Senate campaign, and correct me if I'm wrong, said that you were open to national background checks back when it was being debated by Toomey and Manchin. They had a bipartisan quote-unquote proposal. Mm -hmm. are, are we doing more harm to the party and the movement by engaging in this circular firing squad and not really teaching people, just fighting each other? Well, first of all, I never did back the tumor Manchi bill, and I do not support universal background checks. I do support criminal background checks for people who buy guns from dealers, and as do dealers and gun owners. All of us who are uh, gun advocates and enthusiasts do not want criminals buying guns. That does not amount to universal background checks. Universal background checks mean a national database on every citizen, and I would not support that. But certainly, gun dealers will have access to, to criminal background checks, and you know we all support that. Um, they wanted to show, close the uh, gun show loophole. Right, which so you, I do you, not support. You do yeah, not yeah, support I, in other words, I okay. want to be able to, to give my, uh, my son-in-law a gun for a gift without having to go through the government for the right to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's true. Um, and I've been a strong A-rated support. In fact, today I was endorsed by Gun Owners of America, which is a powerful organization. I'm A-rated by the NRA my entire political career, and I'm proud of that. Um, but back to your original question... I don't know if active debate within a party is a circular firing squad or a way to define the party and what it means and what it stands for. And, I, and, and it, it's that kind of argument that moves people and moves their ideas. And so in order to, to say we're not going to have that kind of debate sort of ends discussion. And once you end discussion, you end the movement of ideas. But that's my point, though, that it, it's one thing to have the debate. And I, I think primaries are great, if for no other reason I'm a political blogger. So it gives me plenty of stuff to well, write. I think primaries are many ways more important than general. I, I think general. in many cases it's true, especially now that we have these gerrymandered districts, unfortunately, yeah. something I'm sure we're both against. But sometimes, and I find this in my blogging world, 
you'll say something about one candidate and someone will call you a rhino and it's almost a way to shut down the discussion. And I think things are not always that simple. Like, for example, I know a lot of people in New Jersey now in the Republican base are calling Chris Christie a rhino. But Chris Christie's endorsed you before. Yes, yes. And I think his brother's given you a donation. There was an article yeah, in Politics yeah. about it. His brother so, has supported me with a maxed out contribution. I have supporters like Steve Forbes who've donated to my campaign and many, many others. In fact, well over 5,000 donations. But... Yeah, I, I don't think calling people's rhino. In fact, I don't think you'll ever find me ever having used the term rhino. I think it's kind of whatever. But um, I'd rather stick to the to the issues. I think issues speak for themselves. Now, when you get down to D.C., if you make it past the primary and past the general, there's a ton of things to tackle, not just Obamacare. What would be your number one priority? That Steve uh, Lonigan would want to either write that bill or get well, on that uh, bill that, as a that, primary response. Because my, my number one issue is the economy and the growth of real jobs through the private sector, not the government. I want to co-sponsor right. and write a bill that will require that on a regular basis, every department that has regulations has their regulation sunset. And that's where we compromise. I want the bill. Whether they sunset six, seven, or eight years, nine years, that's the compromise part. Right. But what I would require is that, for example, on every seven-year basis, all of the regulations of the EPA right. sunset and go before a commission for review regulation by regulation, determine which are destructive, which are ineffective, which are contradictory, throw out whatever we can because we're way too overregulated. And then Congress, right. not the Bureau itself, but Congress votes on what what rules they will reestablish once again. That is a great way of slicing through the bureaucracy and getting the burden off the business owners of this country. That is going to be the bill that I, I hope to be the prime sponsor of. Yeah, I think, I think you and your primary opponent also believe, agree, I should say, on many different issues. But one area where I have noticed there is a distinction is you support the flat tax. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you would actively pursue in Washington? Adopting a federal flat tax. And I, and I think that's why I got such a nice check from Steve Forbes. Of course, we on the, uh, that free rook Act, free market side, understand that progressive taxation is the mechanism whereby you redistribute wealth, which becomes a role of government, which government constitutionally never should have had. And I'm a major supporter of the Constitution of the United States. I will support a flat tax. I will vote for a flat tax. We can negotiate how that flat tax works. Um, it might start at the poverty line and up. It might be all, but we need to put an end to progressive taxation and the politically determined decisions that how to redistribute our wealth. And by the way, my opponent in front of you on your interview said he has no trouble with progressive taxation as long as we have the right rates. That's similar to saying we'll have some role of the government in health insurance as long as we do it the right way. The answer is no. I would like, I'd like to see my, the epithet on my tombstone to be, this is the man who ended the IRS as we know it. And the way you put an end to the IRS and the threat of the IRS is by eliminating our complex tax code mm -hmm. and reducing our tax return to a single postcard. Um, and again, I'll go back to what Ronald Reagan said in that great speech, A Time for Choosing. Do we have the courage to end the immorality of the progressive tax? Reagan was a brilliant man, very much a deep thinker. He understood that it was immoral to politicians to determine who should pay a bigger percentage, how much that percentage should be, so they could redistribute it to buy votes. Um, flat tax really comes right out of the Bible, um, and that's what I'm going to fight for. Would you support a camp-type compromise? A lot of people are familiar with, uh, although I should probably explain it, and the odd chance that our listeners haven't heard of it, uh, retiring congressman, unfortunately. David Camp promoted a compromise whereby we would have a flatter tax, but there would maybe be, I believe there was two brackets, yeah. and it would eliminate yeah. many of the loopholes, quote-unquote, which I hate when the left calls them loopholes because if I'm already paying millions of dollars in taxes, Thank you the fact that, that I get to legally save some is absolutely no, absurd. No, I, I happen to agree with you. It's hard to explain, but, but thank you. That, that, I know you, you know your stuff when you talk about because loopholes are actually tax cuts for many people. Well, well, that's right. I mean, even here in New Jersey, we yeah. get on people for uh, you know these farm credits. They're already paying more taxes than 100 other people will pay in a lifetime. I'm not saying they shouldn't pay that, but well, maybe well, it goes back to our inability to teach math. Well, you in know, the schools lot, because they don't understand the percentages a, a, matter. A lot of liberals will say that deducting your, your first mortgage interest is a loophole. Right. They'll call that a loophole. So right. that's where you get into the polit Once you go to a flat tax my money. and you get rid of all that stuff, all yeah. those arguments are gone. Politics is out of taxation. It's a flat tax. It's clean. It's simple. Every no and everybody has skin in the game.
Mm-hmm. See, if I had my ideal world, mm-hmm. I'd have a flat tax starting from dollar one. Mm-hmm. I want every person to have a piece of our government to know what they're investing. So when government makes a decision, mm-hmm. from the wealthy to the poor, say, that's impacting me. Right now, we've created a permanent underclass of people who are not paying taxes, and they don't care. So if, if the cost of a, of a program goes through the roof, so what? Mm-hmm. They're not paying for it. We need to engage all citizens. One of the other areas where we're having this issue in the Republican Party where we're trying to figure out what our message is. I think we all kind of share most of the same general principles, but it's where do we compromise, how do we communicate. It, foreign policy. I think we're increasingly divided by into camps where we have people that think more like uh, Ron Paul, mm-hmm. who are quote-unquote non-interventionalist mm-hmm. on the one side. And then on the other hand, we have folks who, I don't like to call them interventionalists, but they believe in a more active foreign policy. I know Chris Christie just gave a speech in Manhattan over the weekend where he called for America to be more proactive after Barack Obama's first term and a half where we have unfortunately allowed many situations to unfold without any attempt by America to assert its authority and protect our national interests. Where does Steve Lonigan fall in this growing divide within the GOP? Um, the founding fathers envisioned our, our military defense as being something that was there to defend the United States of America's borders and our interests, not to be the police state for the rest mm. of the world. Um, and you can find numerous commentaries on that dating back for over 200 years. I want to see a very strong military defense. I want, to, I want state-of-the-art aircraft for our Air Force. Um, one of the big issues that our, our United States Navy is at an all-time low. The consequences we're seeing of the, the number of ships on the high seas being at an all-time low is we're seeing piracy, which you've never seen before. Uh, having less ships and a weak navy means a threat to our trade corridors and our trade routes, which threatens our economy. So I would invest in a strong military defense, but not an interventionist or police mm-hmm. military. We're not the police force for the rest of the world, um, and we shouldn't be. We shouldn't be the primary funder of NATO. I'd like to see us deploy anti-ballistic missiles along the, the Russian now expanding border to keep them back, but we shouldn't pay for it. Let them pay for it. We missed the boat on that one, didn't we? Yeah, we, we certainly did. But the other, the, so, so our role Fair. is to defend our nation, not to be involved in, I don't, in everything that happens in this world. And, and I, don't, I don't want us to be in a perpetual state of war. We have been. And that's some of the recent conflicts like Syria. We didn't have to go to Syria. Okay. We can just float a couple of our, um, um, you know, uh, aircraft carriers off of the coast of Syria, and that sends a very powerful message without ever put any boots on the ground. Frank. What you're seeing now, and I think we all know that, is Putin is feeling his oats because he knows we're weak, and he knows our president is weak. Remember that Ronald Reagan took down the Soviet Union without firing a shot just because of the presence of a powerful military. I am a major supporter of, despite some things that have come out of my opponent, of the Joint Base. The Joint Base McGuire is a model. You know, when they first formed the BRAC commissions years ago, they talked about this kind of a Joint Base being mm-hmm. the model for future bases, where you can have your Army, your Air Force, Air, Air Force and your Navy, when you can deploy your Army rapidly right to the Air Force Base. It's a perfect model and was the most important base on the East Coast. So I would... I support a major investment into our military defense system. However, mm-hmm. the military budget is a big bloated government budget rampant with waste. Mm-hmm. Sean Hannity just week had a last week had a 20 minute segment with Jeff Dupree, I believe it was, on the massive amount of money being wasted in the military budget. We can do better than that. The military, the Pentagon hasn't been able to produce a clean audit in over a decade, and there's hundreds of millions of dollars of money just missing. I want to clean that up and see that money invested in F-18 fighter jets, F-22s, uh, state-of-the-art you know, ships on the high seas. The fact that our Navy has more admirals than it has ships is outrageous. Uh, and make America that type of powerful military force that we were in the 1980s that took down the Soviet Union. Another, you, you raised the military funding issue, which is one thing that your opponent in the primary has raised. Mm-hmm. The other issue is Sandy funding. Mm-hmm. Now. When that package was going through Congress, I remember writing about it and saying, whoa, you know, I believe the federal government does have a role in assisting the states when there's a major national disaster. However, at the same time, what's the rush to push this thing through with all of this pork (laughs) when if you look at the timetable of it, 
a lot of the funding wasn't supposed to be deployed for at least nine months, uh-huh. if I remember correctly, the time scale. At the same time, I got to say, you did give, and if you're misquoted, I want to give you the opportunity to correct it, but you did give a very flippant answer when you said, well, listen, people need to learn to just, I don't want to say it was deal the with it, but it was something was, along No, no the famous the lines. phrase was suck it up. Suck it up, right. The extended phrase was suck it up. It's not the role of taxpayers to pay for people's second homes or short houses. Right. And that was the whole phrase. And, yeah. that, and see, that's one of the things. That well, you know, man, I'll be 100% uh, honest with you, though. I mean, that's always been one of my critiques that I've written about on my website about you. I always agree with you, like 95% of the time on paper, but sometimes the delivery, I don't know if I always agree. And as somebody who talks all the time, too, yeah, yeah. either in court or on the web or whatever else, yeah, sure, I mangle phrases. But, I mean, are you worried that even though I agree with you on the basics of that bill, that that's going to create a problem for you in the general election? Well, to be able to communicate to people, hey, there's a better conservative way to rebuild? Uh, Cory Booker pounded me over the head with it and didn't do any him any good. I, I won every town on the Jersey Shore except Atlantic City. Um, people around the Jersey Shore get what's going on. The Sandy Bill was the poster child for ridiculous pork barrel spending. And in fact, mm-hmm. in the dictionary, it should be next to the word boondoggle. Politicians took advantage of the suffering of others to pour millions, billions of dollars into pork barrel spending. Look, I agree, five I agree. million for fisheries in Alaska, forty-one million for the Smith. We've seen it all over and over again, and the money is not getting to the people in need. And you, I, I had it today with a conversation with a guy who's going through nightmare stories with FEMA. We all know yeah. it. So this is a model for a failed government program. And I said back then that we do not have the mechanisms in yeah. place to do this. Take time to do it right. Block grant the money to the counties. Mm-hmm. They could do a much better job than FEMA can. Um, and also, where's this money coming from? See, here's the other big difference between my, my opponent. Where's the money going to come from to pay for this? Well, I propose that we cut funding to, to places like Pakistan and, uh, and Egypt, where they just as well slit our throats as look at us to build their bridges and roads and fund the bill that way. Instead, what they did is they turned on the printing presses and the Federal Reserve Bank produced money out of thin air, increased the national debt. Totally unacceptable. If right. these politicians were so committed to doing the right thing, they should have slashed some of the many areas of the federal budget where they could have found this money. They didn't do it. There's articles coming out every day about the failure of Sandy, and people see through it. They know it. Um, but and we're you know, kind of trapped, this, right? Because we send so much down to D.C. Well, every year, down 95, and then we have to beg for it to come back. Well, there's the basis of what you said earlier. Does the federal government have a role in helping the states? They do. Unfortunately, they do because of our income tax structure, because New Jersey pays so much money to the federal government, gets only a fraction back. So let's grab back every penny we can. Uh, and I don't know the answer, but maybe you've done more research on this since you've been a proponent of the flat tax for a while. Any idea of what we might be saving? If we went to a federal flat tax here in New Jersey, because I think we send something like 120 billion to DC every year. Uh, there would be a savings. There's been different calculations over the year when Dick Army was doing it and others, but they they fluctuated based on economic changes. So I I, I wouldn't point to it exactly. Okay. There is absolutely a savings. There's no doubt about it. But then, uh, but I can't tell exactly what that is. But you know, it goes beyond just the savings, man. It goes to the fact that you don't have these complicated tax returns. You don't have to go through a nightmare. Oh. You know, there's a lot involved with that. I mean, just the time and money that people would save on accountants and yeah. turbo tax and everything well, look, else you have to invest money my in. My opponent has stock. attacked me for supporting a flat tax. I find that kind of shocking. It's a core Republican principle. Majority of Republicans support a flat tax. A majority of Democrats support a flat tax in a poll that came out about, oh, two months ago. I think it was a Pew Research poll. A majority of Democrats. It might not be the Pew, but... It's unbelievable. So the other big spending issue, I'm sorry, we went off track. We talked about Sandy. Oh, the military. You know, again, my opponent says, oh, my, Lonigan wants to cut, you know, the waste from men, money from the military, the defense budget because of all the waste. And, mm-hmm. and, and his position is keep spending and wasting as long as you have enough money for McGuire. That's not good enough. We'll have enough money for McGuire. We'll have enough money for what we need. We should not accept the status quo. It was Ronald Reagan who pointed to the $435 hammer. Uh, he had no trouble attacking waste in the military budget. Neither do I. Going forward to June 3rd, mm-hmm. I don't like to live my life by polls and endorsements. You both have a lot of endorsements, but we only have two polls mm-hmm. that have come out. One was an internal poll, which it's an internal poll, but it's still a poll. The other is from Patrick Murray's Monmouth Polling mm-hmm. Institute, which is mm-hmm. usually pretty accurate. Mm-hmm. Both of them show you behind. 
Mm-hmm. Not by dozens and dozens of points, but I think they were both double digit. Mm. Are now you, the Patrick Murray's poll was was about seventy five percent moderates, and if anybody's that, convinced that moderates are coming out to vote in a primary, so you, you dispute a sample. Yeah. Well, the other thing he said in the in the poll, which I thought was was outstanding, and I agree one hundred percent, is I'm clearly the conservative in the race, and my opponent's the liberal. He wrote that. And what he said, which was bizarre, and I'm kind of shocked. But is, Patrick, but is he really a liberal, though? That's my only well, thing. And, and I, let me finish. The Patrick Murray said that conservative Republicans usually don't show up in primaries. What's this guy talking about? Of course they do. That's who drives primaries. <laughs> I, think, it, I, think, I think the point that Patrick was making is for whatever reason he saw less enthusiasm. I don't know. I went to law school because something as complex as developing a statistical model is not something I enjoy. Yeah, but, yeah, well, um, <laughs> but I think that's what he was trying to argue. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of interesting in this day and age. But that's going to come down to turnout. Yeah, of course it is. It's, it's kind of funny to say that conservatives aren't motivated. We're seeing it all over the country. Conservatives are chopping at the bit. They're ready to run through walls. That's why we're going to win by a significant number on the third. As far as my opponent being liberal, let me point out our differences. I support the total repeal of Obamacare and putting health care insurance and its needs in the hands of the people and free enterprise. He supports a health insurance program of last resort, exactly like Hillary Clinton. I oppose. Well, that's not exactly like it's, Hillary Clinton. I, it, it, it's the same words as Hillary Clinton. Because saying and again, I, they can negotiate what level. Well, right. Because I mean, like personally, support. yeah. I mean, if I could go back and be king for a day and yeah. go back twenty years and do this myself, I wouldn't want to have any type of structure. Well, or, or, for right now, we. Can but would I think it's the worst thing in the world if we had additional funding for that father of five who gets his legs blown off in Iraq and comes back? And doesn't have any way to provide health insurance for his kids or somebody who's catastrophically really injured. I mean, it's it, interesting as, as a free up, market guy. It, it, it's interesting you bring up that father of five that comes back and, and waits a year or two to get their health insurance or their benefits because an illegal alien comes across the border from Mexico and has a baby and two days later has all the benefits they want. You're going to get no argument out of me on that one. Um, <laughs> So as far as taking care of veterans, I'm totally committed to it. My opponent also yeah. said progressive taxation is not a problem. He's attacked my flat tax. That's a liberal position. Yeah, what he told me is that he wants a flat her tax. No, well, but he didn't endorse the I, flat I've tax. Noticed That's that, fair. I've that, that over time Tom's position sort of changed a little bit uh, in every week or so. Um, he also got up and said very adequately that... Governor Christie should be forcing more spending on uh, things like windmills and solar panels and environmental programs, and he was a major supporter of the Highlands Bill. The Highlands Bill is the worst taking of private property tax rights in this state's history, and I'm a major supporter of private property rights. I always have been, and I've opposed taxpayer subsidies of, um, of windmills and solar panels. He supports it. That's liberal. Um, and my opponent went out of his way, as he, the mayor of Morristown, to fund a government ta- raise taxes to fund a low-income housing project under that famous little thing we call COA, which I have fought tooth and nail for my so, entire political career. Uh, and we both think COA is terrible, and I can vouch for the fact that you've fought COA for years, because mm-hmm. I watched you. You were doing it from before I was involved. But what did Tom do that exceeds the mandate? That's what I don't understand because, I mean, as you all know from being from Bogota and <laughs> not, not being only. a mayor of a town in New Jersey, you're required under that law to provide a certain amount of affordable housing, whether or not you want to. That's part of the reason well, the town I, The difference it. is that I funded it. I fought it every step of the way and never did it in 12 years in a town like Bogota. Tom got into office, raised taxes. Uh, and immediately funded and put his arms around it and said, we need this low-income housing to create diversity in our communities. That's social engineering. That's Barack Obama. So the purported yeah. rationale is what you're zeroing His in on. His exact speech was that this is a way to create diversity in our communities. That's social engineering. That's liberalism. Um, and he raised taxes to do it. Um, and he certainly didn't have to. He could have stopped it. Uh, any mayor can. And a lot of them fight tooth and nail against this. So on the key issues of government-funded housing, progressive taxation, Obamacare, um, he's been a liberal, period. He raised the water tax 600% in his town, and he said it was progressive. He said, this is great because it's progressive. He loves progressive taxation. I'm a solid conservative down the line. I'm not backing off. My opponent is at best a moderate. I would call it liberal. 
Fair enough. Mm-hmm. I know that I can't change your mind. No, you can't. I feel like I could apply into a lot of people in this state. You believe what you believe, I believe it. But that's why I respect you. Well, I want to take um, a bold message to Congress. I want people in well, this district to know question. that I'm going to work as hard as I can to stand up for these issues. And there's somebody, they know where I stand. They may not like everything, but they're going to know where I stand. If, if folks that are tuning in for the first time because we're getting close to primary day say, hey, you know, I like that Steve Lonigan guy He's saying a lot of things I agree with, how can they engage your campaign over Lon- the next two weeks? Lonniganforcongress.com or you can call me uh, at my home at 732-250-2973. It's my home number. Um, I'm always available. You know, Matt, people find it remarkable. As a mayor for 12 years, a high-profile candidate, my home number has always been in the phone book. I've always made myself as accessible as I can. And when I'm a congressman, I tend to be more than accessible. So, so if, say, Jersey picks up the phone and calls you, you'll answer our call. You'll get, you'll, you'll, you might dollars. get my answering machine right now because I'm not there. I'm holding all of you guys to that, by the way. <laughs> this is recorded. Um, final question. How do you like living at the Jersey Shore? I love Coming it. up on Memorial Look, Day weekend. You're in the Lava uh, correct? For, yes, I am. It's phenomenal. Look, I, I, grew, up, I grew up in Bergen County, and I, I moved here in January. We've been looking to do this for a while, and, and it's always sentimental. But the quality of lights being close. I love to fish. So I can get up in the morning, go down, do some surf casting. I love the ocean. It's just, it's just terrific. And the other thing is that I get to be in the middle of this recovery. Like I'm watching the renaissance that's taking place around me, and it's just amazing. And, and most of that, that renaissance is being driven by the private sector. Um, I think that I know the Jersey Shore will come back better in a few years. It's going to be better than ever. I would have loved to see a tax holiday. To the point. Sure. Well, we I mean, have a tax you- month holiday. Well, <laughs> I'm in favor of all the loopholes we can get. Absolutely. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Steve Lonigan and Matt Rooney endorse the loopholes. Matt, thank you. Steve, Try thanks this. so much for stopping by, right. and please stay in touch with us. You got it. Thank you, Matt.